Um, great guys. So, hi everyone. It's an honor to join you today. Do I have anyone named Sheila in the audience? Okay, good. Because we're going to pick on Sheila a little bit. She wakes up uh, around 6.30 a.m. after a restless night, immediately looks at her iPhone and there's a mental to-do list of everything that she has to do. And so after determining that there's absolutely no time to do all of it, um, there's also no time to go to the gym, and frankly, it's kind of cold outside, and it's dark, so why not just skip over it? She goes immediately to the coffee pot and brews that huge cup, that huge, big American cup, puts it to go, um, takes it with her, but forgets her lunch on the way out that she prepared last night. And of course, she's running a little bit late because she hit the snooze button a couple of times, and so now she's stuck in traffic, and she misses that wonderful hour of quiet in the office where you can actually get work done. Um, and the day progresses, and around 1 p.m., um, she's, she's trying to get that report done, except that she can't get through it because every three minutes, on average, uh, she's interrupted by some email or a coworker wanting something. There's nowhere to go for quiet. There's nowhere to go for respite. So she decides, finally, I'll just take a legalized drug break, which means heading for lunch and capping it off with, of course, caffeine and sugar to stay alert the rest of the day, barely make it, and then drive home. So, if this sounds like you or someone that you know, um, you are definitely not alone. This idea that you're not accomplishing what you want, um, you're physically, emotionally tired, you're falling asleep and even in public spaces, you're frustrated with parts of your job. In fact, globally, over 30,000 people were surveyed and we found that stress was the number one issue in workplaces around the world. And there, we're actually looking at the research saying that it's, Workplace stress is the new secondhand smoke. So hopefully my colleagues in public health have convinced you at this point that smoking is not good for your health. What you might not know is that actually workplace stress has a cumulative impact over time equivalent to secondhand smoke. And you spend about a third of your life, 90,000 hours at work. So when you do what Sheila does day in, day out, week after week, month after month, and year after year, it has a cumulative impact on your health. You also, if you're 40 years old, do I have anyone in the audience 40 that wants to volunteer? Um, awesome, thank you, awesome. So that means 36 years of your life have been spent indoors. So uh, you can, I guess you can do the math, about 90% of your time. So 90,000 hours of your life at work, 90% of your time spent indoors, and stress is the number one issue. That so what happens when we're exposed to stress? So there's eustress, there's distress. Eustress is the good stuff, we need it. Distress is when basically your ability to cope exceeds the demands on your system. I'm not here and I cannot tell you that workplace design is going to change your load of stress. But we're gonna start talking about how you can become more resilient to the stress that you're dealing with. And the big issue is not the acute stuff, it's the chronic, the day in, the day out, the constantly fatigued stress. In fact, we now know from an epigenetic level, and the research is only 10 or 15 years old, that you can actually impact your DNA in a four to eight week cycle, depending on the stress that you're exposed to. Originally, we were able to detect this in mice in the University of Chicago. The research has progressed, and this is really interesting. So it's not just this warrior mentality like, hey guys, I'm gonna publicly announce that I slept four hours, so I'll be ineffective, unable to focus, and extremely stressed. Um, you're also now having an impact on your DNA. So stress affects multiple parts of the body. This is not meant to be an eye exam, but it is meant to show that things such as weight loss are actually affected by stress as well, which many people don't realize. Um, so what happens with this cumulative stress that's built up over time is that it leads to burnout. Interestingly enough, in the US, it's an outcome, maybe a symptom. Kiroshi, which is the Japanese word, it actually is determined to be so significant that it has a name and a label. In Sweden, I am there often speaking, and of course, they have, of course, a way to pre-detect burnout, and they'll actually be able to get you out of work before, before those symptoms accelerate. But we don't have that in the States. So burnout is determined as being, um, you have exhaustion, cynicism, and inefficacy. So that's the red, that's the burned out as compared to the engaged employee that is full of energy, is involved, and has high efficacy. So what is this costing us? I will argue that we came from an era of infectious disease, we've moved into the era of chronic disease, and we are now in the era of mental disease with upwards of $190 billion being linked to healthcare costs related to burnout. And that is equivalent roughly to New Zealand's GDP. 
So when we survey, and this is the Cronus' work, um, of around 257 registered nurses in the US, we found that 63% noted that they had dealt with burnout. Those levels are somewhere between 30 to 60%, but regardless, this is a third of the population or more reporting that they've experienced at some time. But they're warriors, right? It doesn't matter. They've powered through it, except when they haven't. And we're finding that there's a couple of different linkages with burnout in the nursing population. So according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they're the number one service provider for experiencing burnout. Something that's fascinated me professionally for over a decade is how we design these incredible places, but yet somehow we're still dealing with a population um, that's handling burnout. So it affects direct patient care providers, around 37% of those in direct patient care in hospitals and in nursing homes are reporting burnout. We know that about 10% of the nursing population surveyed, if they say that they're dissatisfied, that's linked to about a 2% difference in patient satisfaction. And we also know that burned out nurses, there's a link um, between issues of catheter infection. Um, and we're linking some of those cases directly to burnout. So what do you do? Well, in our culture, we love to tell the individual, just fix it, it's your fault. Uh, we call it victim blaming. And so just deal with it, just binge watch Netflix and have some more wine while you're at it to just recover and take yourself out of that to-do list. And there's tons of over-the-counter prescription and other medication that you can take. If nothing else, please have something salty and crunchy because we love that food when we're stressed. But I'd like to argue that there's a different way to look at this. And so yes, we need to look at the workplace factors, workplace load. We need to look at how we're um, determining you know, hours and shift work. But we also can look at something much bigger, which is the built environment. So what would happen if Sheila woke up at 6.30 and she was gently stimulated by light instead of having that blasting alarm going off? And after she woke up gently, she went to the nearby gym for a restorative session of yoga, gets back home, ready for her day, gets into the office, has that quiet hour of work, and then the afternoon when she's feeling fatigued or low, goes to rooms that have restoration for meditation, for sleep, um, or is able to actually go off site if she needs to, and is able to focus on the work that she needs to get done throughout the day. So we think that that's very possible through the built environment. Delos uh, has pioneered the well building standard. So this is the first building certification system in the world focused on human health. We launched in 2014 in corporate commercial offices. Um, I'm very proud and excited to be in many of the 36 countries and many, many more that we are launching at around the world. I do truly believe this is a movement and it's a movement built on the shoulders of giants, many in this room that have cared deeply about sustainability. And I think people have been more than ready to take the conversation into the health realm. So in the well building standard, there are seven main concepts. So for a lot of you, we've talked about light, we've talked about thermal comfort, we've talked about air and VOCs and endocrine disruptors, but what about this thing called the mind? Um, you come with it, you have to have it. Mental health is critical for survival. Um, in fact, I'd even call it mental well-being. So if we sort of drill a little bit deeper into stress, what are we going to do about stress? And what are we gonna do about one of the chronic manifestations of stress, burnout? Well, it just so happens that humans are extremely adaptable. If anyone studies human factors engineering, you'll know that when we allow people to adapt, when we give them the power to control what they need, this is incredibly important because you are not the same person from the moment you woke up till the moment you go to sleep. You have different needs, different lighting levels. Some of you love to work in the Starbucks, some of you can't stand it. Sometimes you need a little bit of activation in the morning, but in the afternoon you need a little bit of space to, to focus and think. We're different ages, we're different sizes, we have different cultural beliefs. There's no way I will argue that you're going to design a building that works perfectly for everyone the entire day. So just stop trying. Perhaps look at how you could empower people to choose what they need throughout the day and celebrate some of this diversity. But one of the critical elements of doing that is control. So how do we create environments for control? In the well building standard, we specifically look at these issues. Um, so I'm gonna go a little bit more into detail. So one of the first things is if I need to focus, I know what I need and I'm very different than maybe Sheila or Bob, but let me choose where I need to go, how I focus and how long I stay there. And so this is the creative use of space, including sleep support. This is an example in Madrid of multiple types of interaction zones. 
And clearly, as the well building standard is moving into healthcare, I want to show you some examples of that. But we also know large healthcare campuses have a lot of diversity of buildings on site. And so these are some examples you can even apply to administrative spaces. Sleep support, oh, I love this one, okay. So, if you want creative thought, we are finding the research that says there's no way that you can power through with caffeine alone. So, around 40 minute naps, um, in particular, were connected with improved efficacy for NASA pilots. Um, and this is incredible. We also see this with surgeons, right, where the air rate is so low, people could die. So that nap is incredibly restorative. It's flushing beta amyloids. It allows us to focus. You will only see more and more research around sleep support. This is just a Whitney hint, but for most people, it takes about 20 minutes for caffeine to kick in. So if you have the caffeine and then a nap, it can be very effective. <laughs> You'll just wake up ready to go. Um, we look at wayfinding. I had a colleague in the room from the VA, and we were speaking about this issue and how stressful it is to lose control of your own environment, even before you see a patient. Um, so what about noise? Uh, the well building standards look at a lot of noise. So as a person representing proudly a cusper and a millennial, um, we are horrible at being able to monitor our stimuli. We didn't learn to go to the office and go home and turn off. And we are constantly stimulated from multiple directions and we're having a very hard time monitoring how to turn this off and how to adapt. I don't want silence all day, I don't want noise all day. I actually want a variety and I want the power to choose. So we're seeing a big push, and this is a hard one for the well building standard and for those of our clients that are pursuing it, to really think creatively about noise. So noise absorption, blocking, I love this office. Who has this office and they walk by and they can hear everything happening in that office? And the worst is when you think no one can hear you, but we don't even have solid core doors. I mean, if you can see light coming in from underneath the door, you can imagine people can hear you. So this is actually worse in some ways when we have these offices that say that they allow noise isolation when they don't. A lot of work happening in sound masking. Um, so really encourage you to check out pink noise, brown noise, some of these alternatives. A constant noise at 45 decibels is also not the answer. You never evolved with a constant noise. So thinking about those that have differences, energy cycle, frequency, um, can also be an opportunity. And we're, a lot of movement's happening in this green wall, soundscaping. Right? We love the sound of water. Um, we've actually evolved to be able to detect the sound and smell of water in certain ways. And these green walls are also disinfecting the air as well. So a lot of movement, particularly in China. So we regularly have particulate matter violations over 500 um, in Beijing. In the US, one of the highest days is like 172. We had to get those levels drastically down to like 15 inside the building. So you can imagine the innovations happening. Um, and that's still to deal with air quality, but of course also the walls create humidity, they create a, a beauty element to it, and sound, right? You might ask yourself why reverb is so stressful for the ear and how you don't hear that the same way in many places in nature. So that is the world of psychoacoustics. Acoustics doesn't matter for a building, I'm going to argue, as much as a person's perception of the acoustics and how they are interpreting it that matters as much. We're also looking at this kind of idea that, all right, here's the stress and here's what we're gonna do to try to make individuals more resilient. I can't decrease your load, but I can increase resilience, recovery, choice, control. What about promoting this thing called well-being? Most people really want well-being in their life. If I ask you, are you healthy? They say, I'm not sick. But not being sick is not a way to live. You want to be motivated. You want purpose. You want drive. So what is well-being? This is not touchy-feely. This is survival. It truly is survival because we are seeing those that are able to be more resilient and incorporate more well-being in their life go to the emergency department less. There's less medical claims on them. And the data will continue to rise. In the US, when we survey Fortune 500 companies, 300 of those Fortune 500 companies, their CFOs say we will spend more on health benefits the next three to five years. 6% of them ever look at the ROI. There is a lot of attention being paid to trying to incorporate wellness and well being in workplaces and different buildings around the world. So, how do we do this? All right, I want to explore a couple of these. So, the first one's positive emotion, joy, fun, awe. Curiosity, gratitude is a huge one, you're hearing a lot of that. Um, appreciation, contentment, beauty and design. If anyone knows Roz Kama, she is a fan of saying beauty is the opposite of doing harm. This is not optional. 
Um, I would love it if the well building standard, we got to choose what was beautiful or not. Wouldn't that be fun? No, no. Um, but no, we don't do that. We want to just see that you've incorporated the concept into the design and you've done it through a narrative. We also use biophilia, this idea of humans' innate connection to nature. This is a great project by our partners, our Dayless partner, HOK. Um, and just incorporating, this is the Nang Tang Fong General Hospital, and how they brought nature and respite areas and this idea of joy in nature and the curiosity in finding it. These are tree houses in the sky, right? Um, this is also a great example of bringing in this sort of fluctuation, right? Things are stagnant, do not create these positive emotions in the same way. We're curious, we wanna see movement throughout the day, we connect to the movement. Um, biophilia and focus and collaboration zones. This supports engagement. So it turns out for well-being we need other people. So uh, this is pretty important. The minister in the UK, they just appointed a minister of loneliness. Loneliness is now skyrocketing as a predictor of early onset death or premature death. If you're 55 and you report being isolated, you're at increased risk of premature death. We are social beings. We have to have others. It is how we manage a lot of our stress. And so how do you create spaces that, that engage relationships, right? And these are all examples, and we love food. That's the one you guys need, right? So how do we come together, and how do we have these interaction and create relationships in the workplace? Um, thinking about physical health, this is a great uh, brain scan showing you the difference between just what happens to the brain after a 20-minute walk. We are considering sitting to be the new smoking. Even small breaks or intervals, micro-movements every hour have enough to stimulate the brain. Your ancestors never went to the gym. You weren't meant to sit and then go to the gym and read Us Weekly. Right? You need to have movement throughout the day, and this is really important for metabolic rate, enzyme production, clearly weight gain or loss, and there's a lot of research demonstrating that if you sit for eight hours or longer, it can even decrease um, length of life by over 10 years. Physical inactivity is the fourth leading risk factor of death in the world. So how can Hospitals, in this example, stimulate people not just to walk, but to get um, resistance, muscle movement, as they're walking around the campus. Is the campus for the sick person? Is the campus for the whole family unit? And how can they be involved? So I really want to end by saying, and kind of the field of, of environmental um, biology, psychology, and evolutionary biology are really critical when we try to understand humans in spaces. So Homo sapiens are around 160,000 years old. We've been in cities, we've been in communities for 5,000, cities for 2,000, and the Industrial Revolution only for the last 300. So do you think we've adapted well in our spaces or do you think we've maladapted? Our buildings are meant to protect us. They protected us from predators. They protected us from threat or from either weather conditions. And they even now provide us food and the resources that we need. And what's happening? I think we know better how humans are supposed to live and how humans are supposed to adapt or maladapt. Many people consider the example on the left their reality. I call it agreement reality. You just agreed it would be your reality until it wasn't. And we are not adapting well. We're not recovering. We don't have control. We're not paying attention to our biological cycles. We're not promoting well-being. We're not engaged. We're not stimulated with these positive emotions. We're not encouraged to have relationships. So how do you think we are adapting or failing to adapt? So these are several of my friends of definitions of burnout and stress. But I really do invite you um, to come join our family at Delos. I do deeply believe, and I think it's fair to say I've dedicated my life to really understanding how we can design for health. And I think the mind is a really critical part of that. The well building standard is the beginning of that movement. At Delos, we're innovating in residential. We're innovating in your hotel rooms. And a large commitment that we have is to research with dozens of PhD researchers like myself. And I help to lead a team every day trying to understand this interaction between humans and space. It's not just enough that you tell me you have a healthy building. I've sat through dozens of presentations with healthy buildings. Some of the healthiest hospitals that were lead platinum. You walked in there serving fried chicken. I had lead platinum schools and you walked in and some poor designer had spent days and nights getting the VOCs out of materials just to have them spraying aerosols in the classroom. 
It's not enough for you to tell me that you have a healthy building. You actually need to demonstrate performance over time. And in doing so, we set the scale and reset the scale to understand what truly is a healthy environment that allows people to evolve best. Thank you. Thank you.